Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see so many of you here. We've taken the names of those who aren't present. Um, so I want to share with you an experience of using social media to find and follow stories that we've uh, had in the BBC Radio Documentaries unit. And I hope that you may get one or two ideas that you can take back home with you. So Don't Log Off is a 30-minute programme uh, on BBC Radio 4 that relies entirely on Facebook and Skype. Uh, now, we're currently recording our seventh series, and we've made, we've made 19 programmes in total. Um, and from the start, the brief was very simple, uh, which was that my presenter, Alan Dean, and myself would find random people using social media, interview them on Skype, and we would get them to tell their stories. Uh, now, each program uh, features four or five stories which are grouped around a central theme. Uh, and the theme may be connection and separation, uh, or going it alone, and so on. So here's a few moments uh, from the show over the, uh, the seven series that we've done. And I got shot by a sniper here in uh, Lebanon. It was in my leg. You were shot in the leg? Yeah. By a sniper? Actually, yeah. When I was younger, I wanted to be a professional singer. Grab my last three questions, just let me hold you. Don't shrug your shoulders. When did you first realize that your husband was doing things away from you and having this other life? The week after I married him. She said to me that she had something to tell me. I said, well, you can tell me. And that's when she told me that she lied about the miscarriage. You've just been praying for somebody. Yes. And why are you praying for her? She was, she was having a heart attack. Could you describe paradise? If you do good deeds, God will send you to paradise, which is like um, full of gardens. And I literally called my wife from a payphone and I says, are the kids there? She says, yes. And I says, I have a, I have a gun pointed to my head. I want to let you know that I am gay. I says, if it's not accepted by you and the girls, I'm going to kill myself. So, of course, it all sounds very easy when you put audio together in a nice little montage like that. Um, it wasn't so easy. Um, uh, for starters, uh, there was a past success uh, which we were following. Um, Alan had been involved in a previous project, which many of you will remember, called Don't Hang Up, which had a very simple conceit, which was to phone phone boxes around the world, see who picked up, and have a conversation with whoever picked up the phone. And of course, Don't Hang Up, as we know, won many, many awards. Of course, we weren't setting out to match that success. It's always a mistake to try and repeat past successes. But there was something about the randomness of Don't Hang Up, which appealed to us. Um, and we wanted to see if we could in some way replicate that randomness using social networks. So initially, we thought we'd try chat roulette. Uh, now, I, I'm sure that you're not familiar with chat roulette. Basically what happens uh, is that random ordinary people around the world pop up uh, on your screen one by one. You look at each other and decide whether you want to chat. If either party wants to pass, they just click next and somebody else pops up. Um, uh, there it is. Hi there. Um, <laughs> Black. No, fuck. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Off. Oh, dear. Right. Um, okay, that's enough. Um, no. So there's a guy just sort of masturbating on the screen, showing a bare torso. I can see what this is all about. Ha! <laughs> it's, it's a guy in a Halloween mask. You've missed Halloween! <laughs> Sounds like someone's breaking up their room. How's that? Can you hear me now? I can't hear anything, Alan. 
Oh, what a shame. It looks like we're going to have to move on. Um, three young guys in Russia. And he's showing me a cat. It's like an Andy Warhol. You know, it, this is like video installation. Guy just sitting around in his room showing me a joint. Oh, dear, oh, dear. No, thank you. That was relatively disgusting. I, I get the feeling this one maybe not for me. It's like roulette. It's, it's, I, I, I feel like it's like more like Russian roulette at the moment. You know, if it was Russian roulette, I'd have been shot a lot of times by now. Okay, so we didn't proceed with chat roulette. I think it's fair to say it didn't work for us. Um, we thought we'd try Twitter. Strangely, that didn't work either. So um, we uh, decided to focus our efforts on Facebook to find contributors. Um, because I think Facebook is far more of a social network. And uh, I think that the word network is very important. So that was how we decided to, uh, to proceed. Um, of course, what we needed was some Facebook friends. Um, and um, we started with a very, very small number of Facebook friends because we decided very consciously that we didn't want to appeal on air uh, for friends because we wanted the show to have a global feel. And so appealing to a domestic Radio 4 audience didn't seem to make much sense. So how, in this case, did we make friends? Well, we found uh, various Facebook groups which were populated by people who wanted to make random new friends. Um, and we sent out a load of friend requests explaining what we were doing with the show. And of course, some of those friend requests were accepted. Many of them weren't. Um, and of course, of those who did accept our friend requests, even fewer wanted to actually speak to us. Um, and of course, a key challenge was persuading people away from the anonymity of their keyboards to a conversation. Uh, and that was a challenge. So it was a very slow start, but we had a breakthrough. And the breakthrough was speaking to a uh, single mother, Jennifer, in Nova Scotia in Canada. And Jennifer has 5,000 friends on Facebook, people from all around the world. And thankfully, she was willing to share some of those friends with us. And that was the beginning of our network. Um, and she was also a compelling character in her own right. Hello. Hello, is that Jennifer? This is Alan Hi. from BBC. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. I hear there's a storm coming your way. Coming our way? Oh my God, it's been here all friggin' day. <laughs> oh boy, tell me about it. What's happening? Early afternoon, I'd say probably about 11 or so, it started snowing. Yes. So that was Jennifer, snowbound in Nova Scotia in Canada. And I think in some way she encapsulates what we were trying to do with Don't Log Off. Um, unlike Don't Hang Up, which was about speaking to people in public places, Don't Log Off is about finding people in their private spaces. And people who are often in some way isolated from the world. And I think what this combination of Facebook and Skype enable us to do is to find people in their homes, in their bedrooms, in their offices, in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And that can feel very intimate, I think. And, and it's very different to asking people to go into a BBC studio. I think being on Don't Log Off doesn't feel like being on the BBC. And I think it yields very different results. This is Luna, who spoke to us from her university in northeastern China. Who, who is there in the room with you? You know, I live in the dorm and I live with my roommates. We have a curfew. Our curfew is 11 p.m. and we have someone cut off the, the electricity and we can't use the electricity after 11 o'clock p.m. And what time is it now? Uh, it's 0.13. It is now past 11. So is you, are you now yeah. beyond the curfew? 
Yeah, so I have to use the battery in my laptop. And how long have you got left on your batteries? Uh, let me see. Uh, 21 minutes. So we can speak for 21 minutes. It would be very nice to speak with you for that amount of time, Luna. And I nice to talk with you too. So here's how the conversation with Luna in China ended. But you don't have Facebook in China. Is there Facebook yeah, we, in China? You know, yeah, Facebook is blocked here in China. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, I don't know why, um, they have blocked. Oh, oh. Hello? Hello? Luna? I've lost Luna. There we go. We lost Luna. So Don't Log Off, I think, does take us to places that we couldn't ordinarily get to. But um, and I, another example of that is recently we spoke to a young Nigerian guy in the United Arab Emirates who had been lured there with the promise of a great job. Um, but, of course, had ended up just handing out flyers and leaflets in the street and was basically trapped in the UAE because his employer had his passport. Um, and we spoke to him in uh, a labor camp where he was sleeping in a room with nine other people. Um, so, as I say, I think this does get us to places where we wouldn't ordinarily get to. Um, but for all its intimacy, sometimes the outside world does intrude on these conversations. And, of course, that can create some powerful moments. This was what happened when we were speaking to a guy in Cairo. I just used to keep the things inside. I didn't used to talk to my family about the things. Mm. When, when I just hear the... Um, um, sorry about Who's that? There's like a big fight out there. Like, See, that could be a gun. Is that a gunshot? Yeah. Um, uh, how close are they? Like it's really close. It's just happened again. I could hear another shot. Just a second. I just hope that the gun won't uh, kill me myself while opening the window. <laughs> be careful. Uh, it's been sh sh oh, my word. I just heard Man. another. <laughs> you sound very relaxed. The reason why it didn't, you know, scare me, that I just used to hear these things. So it's interesting when a conversation turns into a scene. Um, and I think that's quite interesting. And I'll come back to that thought. So one of the things that I want to re-emphasize is that in all of these conversations, we know hardly anything about these people before we start talking to them. Um, we often don't even know where they are or what their real name is. So for all the technology, the skills of a radio producer are absolutely key to this project. Now, we know everybody has access to this technology now, um, but the skills to use it effectively are radio skills, skills that come from experience. Um, I don't, also, I don't want you to think that we somehow move seamlessly from one conversation to the next. I mean, this is often a very painful process, and it's a process that usually only starts at 5 o'clock in the evening, because that's the way that we can maximize the number of time zones around the world where people are likely to have enough time to speak to us. Um, so, um, so it is often very hard work, and, and work that doesn't finish until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, and sometimes later. Um, but having said that, uh, the many late nights did pay off, and we got a second uh, series. And in that second series, we met Brian for the first time. Now, Brian talked to us about his quest for love online. I was just browsing profiles in, in Russia, <laughs> and I stumbled across the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> but this was no ordinary online romance. Do you speak Russian? No, I'm learning to speak Russian. And does Anna speak English? No, not yet. But I was able to translate her profile, and I, I began to chat with her using uh, Google Translator. So we'll come back to Brian. Um, 
But、um, as the series developed, we were very conscious that there was something limiting in using Skype for every program. For instance, if we wanted to do a program about just one person, would it be possible to do that using Skype? Could you really bear half an hour of one person in that very compressed Skype quality? Well, there was、um, someone who we suspected might make a whole program, but there was a problem.、Uh, Jenny was in the middle of the Australian bush with a very poor internet connection, very poor indeed. So we decided on this occasion to buy her a very cheap recorder. One of those Zoom、uh, entry-level recorders. Send it to her, and Alan would still speak to her on Skype, but she would record the conversation at her end, send the file back to us, and put the two together. But it also gave us an opportunity to ask her to record some of the sounds of of the animals around her. And of course, I'm sure many of you have done this, and you have absolutely no idea how it's going to work out when you send a contributor a recorder.、Um, but anyway, she sent us the audio back to us using WeTransfer, and、uh, uh, there was 12 minutes of stuff that she'd recorded outside. And I thought, well, that's not very much. There's probably nothing good there. But、um, anyway, here's a section from that program. First, some sounds of the bush, and then Jenny. Talking about her husband, Bob. Two large, three large white cockatoos. Oh, here's another one. Four in that tree. There it goes. Love those old fellows of the bush. The black ones are harbingers of rain. There they go. He had his first heart attack at a demonstration to stop the coal seam gas industry in Queensland.、And、then, when he had the heart attack, we'd made all kinds of plans about what we were going to do, and a lot of it was going to be travelling. So we were going to do the journey around Australia and drive. So I love road trips. We both love road trips. And we were going to do that, and maybe go to Vietnam and meet up with Rebecca and Laura in New York, and so we had a life, a different life planned from what we'd been living, yeah. But it never happened. No, no, it never happened. He collapsed and died. Had a massive heart attack. So that was just recorded on one of those Zoom、uh, recorders, and of course, recently we've been asking people just to use their smartphones and to send us the、uh, the audio file, and that's also given us some great results.、Um, so back to Brian, Brian in Boise, Idaho.、Uh, you'll remember he met his Russian girlfriend Anna online. The only trouble was that she couldn't speak English. He couldn't speak Russian, and they communicate entirely using Google Translate, or、um, Google Translator, as Brian always seems to call it. Um, uh, so um, the great advantage of this, convers- this, this combination of Facebook and Skype is that we were able to track this relationship as it developed over time, and we are able to do it very cheaply. And very easily, and, and this is something that we've done with our contributors time and time again, and we've done it over months and years.、Um, and the story of Brian and Anna developed in a way that none of us had expected. A year passed, and amazingly, Anna decided to move to the United States with her two children,、um, and she still couldn't speak English. Uh, and he still couldn't speak Russian,、um, and we wanted to get her arrival on tape. So,、uh, thanks to the Skype app on Brian's smartphone,、um, Alan was able to eavesdrop on Brian's tense wait for Anna to emerge into the arrivals hall at Seattle Airport and to capture again the scene. 
She should be here any minute, but it had to have landed. Oh, there's some people coming up the escalator here. Excuse me, sir, what flight were you on? Uh, coming from JFK. Oh, okay, 1543? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, this looks like it. And I still don't see. Nope. <laughs> you guys coming from New York? No. Oh, there she is. There she is. I missed her. <laughs> oh, I missed you too. Oh. And of course, what was the first thing Anna said to Brian? Could you put your phone away, please? Um, so Anna and Brian have 90 days to get married. Um, or she and the kids would have to leave the United States. That was the visa requirements. Um, and the story ends with Alan and myself going to uh, Boise, Idaho to attend the wedding. Um, in fact, we were official witnesses at the wedding. So somewhere in uh, a courthouse in Boise, Idaho, is a piece of paper with my signature on it witnessing their wedding. Now, of course, that's something that we would never have predicted when we started this project. Um, and we have uncovered a lot of, of, of stories from around the world, and stories which we just wouldn't have got to without this combination of, of Facebook and Skype. And uh, we now have our own network, um, and Alan puts up videos to um, update people on where we are with the series, and we get a good response. Um, we, don't, we still don't have a vast number of friends, but you don't need a vast number of friends um, to undertake this sort of project. What you really need is a close and ongoing connection with the friends that you have, and that enables you to follow people's stories. Uh, somebody else who we've spoken a lot to is... Uh, a young woman called Daria in the Ukraine, who we've been speaking to for years. Um, she's very, very severely disabled. She can't leave the house by herself. Um, but she is the main money earner in the household. She teaches English um, to people online. Um, and, and she is quite remarkable. And she keeps in touch with us on Facebook. Another guy um, uh, called Hank in Arkansas, uh, who's in his late 60s, who plays the harp. Um, and we followed him through his wife's experience of breast cancer. She sadly died just before Christmas. And so now we're following him as he uh, embarks on a, a life um, by himself. Um, so um, I just put a few uh, little tips together for this, which is obviously uh, obligatory in this kind of uh, presentation, uh, something to take away with you. Um, so as I say, the thing is that um, it doesn't matter if you start small. You don't need a huge number of friends to undertake a project of this type. And as I say, we still don't have a huge number of friends. Um, the most important thing is obviously to start growing your network slowly. Um, but nurturing your relationships, your friendships with the people that you meet online and the people whose stories you tell is important to keep in touch with those people. Um, and as I say, that enables um, uh, you to follow people's stories for months and for years. And of course, you know, that's something which is more and more difficult to do as budgets get smaller and smaller. But when you're using this technology, where you don't need to leave the office, you don't need to pay for transport for overnight. It's very quick and it's very easy to do. And of course, you can still accomplish those things which as feature makers we want to, to do, which is to create scenes. Um, so these aren't, these don't, as you've heard, just have to be straight interviews. You can capture action and scenes. Um, so this is something that, can, uh, that can, you can do extremely uh, cheaply 
and, uh, and quickly. And of course, you have the power of following stories over a long period of time. And the passage of time gives stories a kind of gravity, um, which you don't get when you're trying to follow something in a matter of days or weeks. Um, and of course, you can store up the material. You don't have to use it until that story has, uh, has developed. Um, but I suppose my closing thought really is to re-emphasize that despite the fact that everybody has technology, uh, this technology at their disposal now, everybody has access to Skype and, and Facebook, the skills which are needed to tease out those stories, to tell those stories in engaging ways, these are professional skills. And um, this isn't something that just anybody can do. Um, so for all the ubiquity of the technology and the intimacy of the relationship that it can create, it takes a professional, a feature maker, to know how to harness that technology. Thank you. So um, thank you very much, Lawrence. So I think we still have 10 minutes' time. So if somebody has a question, this is your chance now. Anything you want to ask? Neil. Could, could you just comment? There's a mi microphone coming. Thank you. Lawrence, could you comment for a moment about your choice of using Skype as, a fo as opposed to telephone to record the, the interviews? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the quality of Skype is generally better than, than a telephone call. Um, I think there is slightly more kind of range. Um, but, of course, that depends. Um, and one of the discussions that we had, and I remember it was the discussion that I had with Simon um, when we were conceiving this series and developing this series, was, you know, that it, it, Skype is quite, it's still quite difficult on the ear and I remember the first series that we did was very, very tightly cut and tightly edited. And actually what we realized in the end was that you need to hear a, a, a sort of fairly significant chunk of these people for the ear to adjust to the Skype quality. Um, so actually cutting it too tightly is not, is not a very good approach. Uh, and also different Skype lines have different qualities and so actually, if you're cutting a lot of different Skype lines together in quick succession, it's actually quite uncomfortable on the ear. Um, I take your point. I take your points. Uh, but I was also thinking about the fact that your, interview, your interviewer gets to see the person, but the listener doesn't. And uh, I'm wondering if that somehow changes... Uh, what comes out of the interview? Well, actually, we normally turn the camera off uh -huh. because we feel that it's a distraction. Okay. Uh, and also, there's a slightly... It's, it, there's always a chance that it slightly increases the quality of the line if you take the camera off, but the audio will be slightly better. Any more questions? Um, Sylvia, I want... our lovely host. Yes. <laughs> I wonder how did you sort out people, or how long do, did you have to follow people to sort out these ones, uh, they are just under-communicated and uh, don't, have an, don't have stories, or don't have stories which necessarily would develop? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there are some people who we think, well, there's probably going to be two minutes of them, and that's all we'll ever have. Uh, and then, of course, there are some people we don't use at all. Um, I would say the rate of people that we don't use at all is probably 3 in 10. I think probably we would use 70% of the interviews. Uh, of that, you know, the number of people who we're likely to return to is probably 1 or 2 out of 10. Um, so it's a kind of range. And we do, I'm afraid, have a kind of grading system. Um, which is obviously always rather unkind to do that. But because you're dealing with such a huge sort of volume of material and you do kind of forget, then we do have a kind of shorthand of A, B and C and D, um, it, which tends to guide us 
on, you know, w whether these people are, are likely to be, you know, people that we return to. Tim. The ethical issues, or, sorry. <coughs> Hi, Tim Desmond. Uh, ethical issues, guy with a gun to his head, do you tell him to log off or put the gun down? Uh, and legal issues. Uh, the ethical issues, um, I felt, were probably uh, more problematic in the early days when, pe when, there were, when we hadn't done any programs. Um, so now, obviously, we're able to point people to the website and they can listen to the program, so they know exactly what it is they're getting into. In the early days, when there were no programs, they didn't know what they were doing, so there were definitely you know, ethical issues there. Uh, legal issues, I, do, I don't think we've had very many of. The guy with the gun pointed it, 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 at his head was a retrospective thing, so, that, so there, was, there were no issues there. We've ch we, you know, we changed names, like the guy in the labor camp that I talked to you about in the United Arab em Emirates. Uh, we will change his name because obviously, you know, that is, will be problematic with his employer. Um, so, uh, obviously, we, we, we would apply the usual kind of uh, BBC guidelines on those issues. Um, the Facebook account uh, of Alan Dean you've shown to us, uh, is this his personal account or is this, you don't have any regulations from the BBC, therefore? Uh, it is his personal account. Um, we tend within the BBC not to uh, advertise it too widely, um, uh, but, I, but it, it, it's perfectly fine, I think, for him to have his own personal account and, and to use that. Uh, and, in, 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 and it's the only way we can do it because, um, as you know, Facebook is tied to a person. And I know you can get uh, Facebook pages for, for groups or whatever, but, but they're much more limited for, for companies and organizations, but they're more limited in terms of what you can do. So to really get the full functionality, it has to be in his name. He tends to use it just for this show. Um, I mean, you know, he, he does, he's not a He's not a big user of it outside of, of, this, of this show. So it is in his name. Um, but I don't think there are any real problems in that. Um, you know. There are always people who want to you know, make problems, particularly you know, within the organization. Um, but um, it's generally best not to, to advertise these things too widely. So I think one last question, Nadia. Um, you showed us how you used social media to produce radio, but how did you actually promote these stories on social media? Did well, you create you know, postings, or what did you do with it? Well, I mean, this is a very good question, actually. And I think it's a challenge that we have, we, we've never quite cracked, which is to make it a two-way relationship. So, I mean, uh, the title of the presentation is Harnessing Social Media to Find Great Stories. I think what we've always found it, Dip, more difficult to do because it's a fairly narrow pool is to use social media to promote, you know, to promote the program. Now, clearly, we're promoting it to the people who are our friends on Facebook, but that's a small pool. And as we all know, one of the challenges is getting a, you know, a, a kind of large following on social media. And I think that's something that we've always um, found, uh, you know, found more of a challenge. Yeah, so it would be it would be promoted in the usual way uh, on the on the Radio Four Facebook page, on the Radio Four Twitter account. But obviously, there you're in competition with all the other programs on the network, and so they're not going to promote every program. They might promote the first program in the series. Um, so I think that's a challenge that we're still, uh, I think, grappling with. And if anybody's got any ideas. I'll be very open to them. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank and you. if somebody needs a wedding witness, so please contact yeah. him later. I'm very cheap. <laughs>